This episode of the show is brought to you from the Salesman.org HubSpot studio. Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman podcast. Yeah, buyers are looking to make a choice or an improvement in their environment, and a do-nothing deal happens when they decide to stick with their status quo. Maybe the investment that's required is so high compared to those, you know, the change and the benefits they can get, the outcomes they can get, that it's not worthwhile. But one of the important things is that people move away from pain emotionally much more than being attracted to gains. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barron, and I'm the host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have an absolute legend. Really enjoy this conversation. We have Tom Pacello. He is the author of the book, Evolved Selling, which you can find on Amazon and everywhere else as well. And on today's episode, we're getting into what to do with, quote unquote, do nothing deals. So what do nothing deals are, how to break through the status quo and get some more of these closed. And Tom comes at this with tons of research and data. And so there's tons to go out with this episode. So let's jump right into it. Tom, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Pleasure to be here, Will. Thank you so much for inviting me. You are more than welcome. I'm glad to have you on. Okay. On today's episode, we want to get into um, how to deal with what to do when we have do nothing deals. Now, to set things up, Tom, before I kind of throw my thoughts in, into the picture here, what is a do-nothing deal? Let's let's clarify this before we uh, suss out how to deal with the situation. Yeah, buyers are looking to make a choice or an improvement in their environment, and a do-nothing deal happens when they decide to stick with their status quo or their business as usual. And really the whole buying decision process that they've been through, all those meetings, all the committees, all the getting it together, uh, all that time and effort from the buyer perspective is all thrown away. Obviously, your sales time with them is thrown away too. And they decide not to go with you, not to go with the competitor, but just stick with business as usual, You know, maybe relying on that legacy solution or the broke business processes that they're using today. Um, and so uh, unfortunately, we see too many pipeline opportunities ending with do nothing, or as Gartner calls it, no decision. We are clearly biased here on this podcast. Yourself and I, uh, you, you know, you many companies, uh, many roles within the sales space, right? Uh, myself, all I do is help sales professionals close more deals, uh, earn more commissions and, and crush it in their sales jobs. Are there times when a no deal or no decision is the appropriate decision for the buyer? You know, there there could be times where maybe their problem is not that big of a problem. Maybe the legacy solutions and business processes maybe aren't that broke. Um, maybe the investment that's required is so high compared to those, you know, the change and the benefits they can get, the outcomes they can get, that it's not worthwhile. Or sometimes the organization just isn't ready for change. And so those are three just quick ones, Will, uh, that you know, uh, where it is appropriate that maybe your advice to the customer is, look, you know, you might not be ready for this. And I've given that advice to certain customers or, you know what, what you're doing now, you could get some benefit from what I'm providing, but maybe not all of the benefits to overcome all the work and effort and, and risk of, of change. So I think there are times as sellers that we need to be ready to sometimes say, you know what, no decision or do nothing might be the most appropriate. For sure. Because where I want to go with this is, is it a salesperson's responsibility to never have a no deal? Is it in our control or are there other kind of market forces that, that dictate some of this? Yeah, there, there definitely are these external market forces. And you know what? Identifying a company that is going to end up at no decision or, or do nothing as quickly as possible is actually should be one of the missions we have, right? Which is you know, understand that the outcomes are going to be significant, that the company has the investment that they're ready to make, that, um, you know, they're ready to implement a change and be successful. Many of us now are selling subscription services. So our selling doesn't end with that first deal. We have to make sure they're going to be successful and going to achieve those outcomes. So if you're able to identify that a company maybe has one of these three issues um, early, perhaps that's better. You don't waste as much time on them. And maybe you could advise them not to waste their time as well on a decision cycle that might end badly. For sure. It's it's somewhat common sense we want to qualify some of this out, but why I find it difficult to do this practically, you know, when I'm selling our uh, training to the enterprise as opposed to individuals, I do I get into a lot of conversations where 
the buyer is stuck in the status quo. They've always done things one way, and now with COVID, they've been 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 given a big kick in the ass to do all the cliche stuff of digital transformation, remote selling, all these kind of things. So now there's a there's a bit less status quo in the marketplace from my perspective. But where I find it difficult to qualify is when logically they should move forward, but emotionally they get stuck. Do you have any thoughts on how to suss out when we are in the qualification process, whether we want to invest our time into this buyer, um, whether we whether we can suss out whether logically we know that they want to work with us, but whether emotionally they are ever going to come around? Yeah, there are a lot of organizations that are stuck, stuck in the mud kind of organizations. And I don't think there's a precise science for uh, understanding whether those companies will move or not. If the company is willing to recognize that they are broken uh, and that it is costing them a lot of money to stick with the status quo, I think that that's one way where you can get them to um, maybe know that they're going to move. I think the other is that you have to think about the outcomes and the value not just from an organizational or a company standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. So personally, does your stakeholder have the motivation to change? Are they feeling enough pain every day from what's going on? And are they willing to put their job on the line um, or perhaps their reputation on the line by being the champion behind your solution? And what is the business value benefits that they're going to, to ultimately get is important, but sometimes the personal benefits that they may be able to achieve by doing this is something that you want to amplify to understand whether emotionally they're connected with the solution or not. I know it's difficult because we're talking very in broad terms here, but are there any qualifying questions we could ask? Um, One that comes to mind could be, as I'm jotting down notes from our conversation here, Tom, could we ask a question along the lines of, do you believe that there could be a better solution? Just to just to see if there's a willingness to to have someone put up a solution in front of them and to move forward with it. Is there anything else we can ask question wise to uh, kind of? You can. Uh, well, one of the big things with emotion though is that you can ask questions about the benefits that that you want the person that they they may be able to get out of it on a personal basis, an organizational basis, or a business basis. Um, personal are the things that impact them every day, recognition, raises, um, respect from the organization. Business is the cost savings, the um, uh, productivity improvements, process improvements, risk avoidance, and then revenue growth. And then on an organizational basis, how does this impact the ultimate end user and the customer? and improving the experience of all those that are involved. So those are the three dimensions that we measure on. But one of the important things is that people move away from pain emotionally much more than being attracted to gain. So the only change I would make, Will, in your question is focus on does the person you're talking to do they have a good perspective on the personal pain they're experiencing today? And is that extreme enough for them to move? And then on the organization side and the business side, similarly, rather than say, oh, do you, do you believe you're going to be able to get these benefits out? Say, how bad is it? How, how bad do you think it is today? And what is that costing you, perhaps, by sticking where you're at? And so if you're able to get them to clearly understand and to be able to articulate back to you in a more amplified way, the pains that they're experiencing, that's when I find that you've made that emotional connection and that they're ready and they're primed. And you have to do that, not just for your champion, but all the other, you know, dozen or so other flipping stakeholders that we have in every deal now to make sure that everyone understands the pain that's involved. And too quickly as sellers, I think we understand our solution and we understand maybe the benefits that it can deliver. And I think too often we jump to that rather than really spending time to make sure that the customer and all of the stakeholders really understand how much the affliction is costing them and how painful it is and making sure everyone is aligned on that before we jump to the solution and the ultimate benefits that get delivered. It's interesting you uh, talk about pain versus pleasure. We're actually going through, and this is marketing, the audience uh, will appreciate this though. We're going through a massive change with our marketing over at Salesman.org and our training product and and the the things that we offer at the moment. Because we did a poll and I think it's about three and a half thousand people replied to the poll. And now 
polls are not ideal a way to measure uh, you know intent and, and different things but the data is what it is and we asked people essentially what they wanted from sales training what, what do you want to achieve by doing this and i thought the answer would be earn more money um more prestige a, a, an easier life but the response was all uh, negative people wanted mm -hmm. um people were suffering from they talked about a, a lack of motivation even mm. the way that they framed up the answers. It wasn't, we want more motivation. It was, I don't want to have this lack of motivation anymore. I want that pain to be removed. Um, what was another one? That, that was the top one by a mile. Salespeople in our audience, for, however, for whatever reason, are, are massively unmotivated at the moment. Another one was complexity. People wanted things to be simpler, which is why we're pushing everything towards this selling made simple branding that we're doing now. And I'm really focusing on adding uh, fundamentals and, and frameworks as opposed to more higher level conversations and topics like that. And it was really interesting to me that it was all, how can I remove these negatives as opposed to how can I earn bigger commissions, which was what my assumption going into this. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me. And I'll talk psychologically about where we're at with a couple of those things. But the good news for you, Will, is that you're connecting to a pain which is much easier than trying to convince someone of a gain. So you should be leveraging that if you're able to, you know, solve that pain problem because they're recognizing they do have this pain and they want the motivation. They're suffering from a lack of motivation that you're, you're in a great spot. So anytime we can get our buyers or customers to really connect with them on the pain side, we know that we're solving something that's worth solving and worth it for the client to invest in. And that's a good thing. Um, Let's talk a little bit about simplification and why that is coming up. And I think this goes a lot to the no decision drivers, uh, the do nothing drivers that, that Gartner found. So first of all, when we look at the problem, 94% of buyers have participated in a canceled buying cycle over these past two years. And with COVID, although you indicate that things like transformation and some of these projects, you can't stick with status quo, we're actually seeing more of an issue of change rather than less. And, and you wouldn't think that because the motivation is there to change, but there's a couple of factors and 40% of buying journeys right now are ending in no decision. So what's changed and, and what's driving that? Well, there were three issues that Gartner came up with. One was, you know, why are decisions ending with do nothing? Changes in priorities. So 49% indicated that. That's the number one issue. So what's happening in organization is, and what's happening as a seller, you're going in and underneath the buyer, all of these things are changing and things are in a lot of flux right now. So you start off selling towards one challenge that the buyer's having. And before you know it, two weeks in, a month in, their priorities have been shaken up because their management and executives are having to move so quickly. And so we're facing this uh, quicksand of changing priorities. And what you have to do with that? Well, you really have to make sure you align with priorities and that you revisit those priorities. Like in subsequent calls, here's my understanding of the challenges we're addressing. Have any of these changed? As new people come on, making sure you're gathering and making sure that everyone involved is aligned. And then making sure you're asking that question to the buyer that says, hey, I know these are your priorities as we go up the chain to the other decision made. Like what is the top level strategic priority we're tying to? Because if you're not aligned to that top strategic priority, even if it's a good business case for this solution and there's good justification behind it, it can sometimes be, well, that's not a priority for us now. We're only focusing on the top three priorities. The second priority was uh, perceived business and or technical risks, 45% indicated that. Here's where simplification and things like transparency and facilitation all come into play. Three absolutely critical factors right now. So what has happened to us during this crisis, Will, is that we're under a lot of stress and strain, personal life, working from home. If you're a seller, one of the pieces of feedback I think you're getting on lack of motivation is, I can't be shaking hands with people. I can't be having dinner with them, right? We've got a lot of extroverts in this marketplace. And they are being um, forced to be introverts and selling through a 13-inch monitor, which isn't good for anyone. But there's a lot of change and tumult, whether that be health-related, um, environmental-related, uh, personal-related, working-from-home-related. 
uh, find, you know, job related. There are a ton of stresses and strains on all of our buyers' personal lives and business lives. Amygdala overload is what it's called. And so when you go in and you start presenting a solution, if it isn't really simple, and if you are not incredibly trustworthy from the word go, and you're not making it easy to understand, easy to buy, and completely transparent and trustworthy, you're not going to get that sale because the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism within the amygdala complex in the primitive brain is already on overload. It's already overstimulated from everything that's going on around each one of our buyers. And when we present a solution, if it is a stack of all of these different options um, and it's really hard, you know, there's a lot of options to assemble these things in a multiple, you know, they're going to go and shut down on you and basically go into possum mode. Um, they might not run. They might not fight, but they'll go into freeze, which is just as common a response as fight or flight, even though everyone calls it fight or flight. So you have to keep it simple. As they're going through the buying process, if you make it too complex and you don't streamline the steps, and if you don't proactively anticipate what they might run into, they can freeze through that process as well. And so you have to facilitate that and trust there used to be a time where you would have to emotionally stoke buyers to change from status quo. Well, think about going in with a challenger-like approach today, which is a very popular approach. And um, I love the challenger guys. I've had a chance to in, uh, interview um, many of the original creators and stakeholders, whether it be for my book or my podcast. And the amazing thing with all of the... Um, a challenger is it works when you go in and you want to shake up the status quo, you use these techniques of delivering insights and education. And, but when everyone is on amygdala overload, you have to temper that. Whereas before, 50% of decision making might have been emotional and 25% of logic was and 25% was trust. We've now shifted to where most of the buying decisions now, 50%, is based on trust. Why? Because there's not a lot we can hang on to out there. You know, when the world is changing underneath us, we want people we can trust. We want companies we can trust. And the key there is to be transparent. You can't do everything. You can't be everything for everybody. Embrace your flaws. Do what you say you're going to do. There's uh, Make sure you got plenty of proof points at every step to back up what it is that you're saying, whether those be real world examples using their solution uh, or your solution to solve their particular problem. So use case demos, um, pilot programs, plenty of success stories, uh, good references, all things like that to build up that trust because that's now 50% of the buying decision. And if you're not able to gain that trust, you could have shaken up the status quo and logically convinced them, but you're not going to get them to make that decision. And then, Will, there's one more. I know I'm going on for a while. Okay. Here. I, not I'm sat here chance. just in <laughs> silence, like just writing <laughs> notes to come at you with a thousand questions in a second because I don't want to inter – I've done it now, but I didn't want to interrupt your flow. Yeah, no, no, no. So there is one third issue that I think is also important in this overcoming and addressing the no decision, and that's budget issues and constraints, 44%. Shoot, that, that shouldn't be any surprise to anyone, right? Even companies that are investing a lot in digital transformation and are spending money because their business models may have been disrupted, they're still being spendthrift. You know, frugal nomics is what I call it, and it is really in full effect right now. So how are you going to get that project approved by the COVID committee? How are you going to get through the CF no? Well, you've got to have financial justification, and you can't leave that to chance. The buyer doesn't know how to justify your solution in. You have to give them and work with them to co-create that business case to then take up to the executive. So align, simplify, facilitate transparency and trust and justification are five ways to kind of address this no decision. Tom, have good salespeople been doing everything that you just described regardless for maybe not decades, but for years now? Is this nothing new? Are some, people, some, people, are some listeners now going to listen to this and go, I'm doing all that and everything's going fine? Yeah. Well, if everything's going fine, that's good. Um, 
Have they been doing it? I think to varying degrees. Um, if you ask the buyers how well they've been doing it, I think you'll see a decided gap, what we call the engagement gap. Sellers are doing some of these elements, but they haven't evolved as quickly or elevated as quickly as buyers want them to. And there's a lot of great research from the RAIN group, Dave Shaby and the team over there, that point to this. And that there is over a 40% gap between what buyers expect you as a seller to deliver. Much of that research was across these exact dimensions mm -hmm. um, and where the sellers are perceived to be. So if we're doing it, the majority of sellers are not being rewarded for it one way or another. Um, so what are some of the things that came up in that research? Well, one of the big ones was listening, right? Buyers don't think that we're listening to them. Well, why is that? Well, in a virtual meeting, what's happening is, you know, Will, as, as you know, you're talking to me or, or as I'm talking to you, your head is down, you're taking notes, right? You're, and so all of a sudden, the buyer is perceiving, because now we're in a new medium, that you're not listening to them. Um, that's but one of several of these factors that, to me, again, are these fundamental selling principles. Like, of course, you've got to align. Of course, you've got to simplify your solution. Of course, you've got to facilitate. Of course, you have to listen. But, but because it's a new medium with virtual meetings and Zooms, because it is a... Um, an environment where consumers, uh, buyers have been spoiled by consumerization and they expect things to be ultra simple and ultra facilitated. And because they're under more pressure and there's more stakeholders involved. So there's all these factors that are adding up to be where if we just did the things we did two or three years ago in the exact same way we did them, we're falling down sure. on the declining value side and, you know, sellers expectations are elevating that much more. So, so I think we have to just work on, you know, having this growth mindset and across each of these dimensions, really look and say, am I aligning the way that buyers expect me to align? Is my solution really as simple as I think it is, or am I overcomplicating it? Uh, we implemented jumpstart services to make it be where there's like, you here, it's all bundled. You get 50 users. It's a quick pilot. You can bail out at any time. So there's a money back guarantee in, in completeness. You got 30, you know, 30, 60, 90 days to try it out. And we do all the work for you. So there's no risk. It's those kind of things that make it a simple decision so that they don't maybe have to go through that long process or worry about which pieces they're going to put together and then how much each piece is going to cost and all the risk involved in that. Um, so you have to rethink each one of these really important elements to say, am I delivering it in a way where I've elevated it to buyer's expectations? For example, justification, if you're just going to do kind of a back of the napkin calculation with no proof points, no research, is that going to be enough? Or am I, are you going to do a deep dive in a spreadsheet that no one can understand? Is that kind of the, the way to deliver it in this professional you know, new century selling model that we're in. And I, I think the answer to a lot of these, if you're really introspective, um, is no, you, you know, these, these are all blocking and tackling elements, but you've got to do them in a different, better way now that we're Zooming in our selling, you know, now that we're all virtual, all digital with this new consumerized buyer, there's, there's a whole set of new capabilities that are going to elevate those sellers that, you know, hopefully are the ones that listen to you and I that are looking to up their game and looking to grow and evolve. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question in a second of, um, do you have any books, resources other than your own that you'd recommend for salespeople who want to learn to simplify and to create value propositions and, and things of this nature? Because that's a skill in its own right. And I think salespeople too often will take what marketing give to them, take what the sales managers give to them and just regurgitate it and assume it works. But before we get to that, I've got one uh, anecdote on this. So we did a new webinar the other day. Uh, um, I, I, I'm pretty open with the webinar statistics. Typically about 10% of people on a webinar when there's hundreds of people on there will sign up to our training product at the end of it. It's how I can sit there, answer questions and essentially sell at scale. Now we changed our um, offer within the webinar. And it's interesting, and this is why I bring it up, because we we added trust to it. 
and I'll, I'll explain what the offer is in a second, just dead simple, the value proposition. We added trust to it. I'm just going through some of our notes here from this episode, made it simpler, um, covered some bu budget issues, and we changed essentially the premise of the training that we offer to individuals to use the value proposition of um, close more deals in the next 28 days, or we'll give you your money back. Just dead simple, no, no complexity, whatever. If you sign up, if you do the training and you run through it and you're not closing more deals, then money back, just instant. And the number of people who signed up in that webinar, it was insane. People would, you could see it in the chat and I'm answering questions. We have our assistant in the studio with me as we're doing these webinars, uh, throwing questions my, di my direction. People were genuinely more excited than our previous offer, which is mm -hmm. the same product, a very similar offer. Um, but th we just worded this slightly differently. The, the, the guarantee's always been there. We just put it front and center. And there was a genuine, um, re and, th and there's, Enterprise, um, we we got it. We closed a couple of uh, larger clients from that as well, multiple seat deals as opposed to just individuals. And it was just from doing, as you've outlined here, Tom, of um, understanding that people's priorities are back and forth and, and, and all over the place at the moment. So obviously our offer just hit the right priority at the right time. Understanding that there's the business or technology risks, the whole premise of our, our, our product. I don't want to talk about it too much. I don't want to plug it on the show. Um, but the whole premise of the product is dead simple. It just works. Everything's framework, everything's outlined for you. You can't really go wrong with it. And um, and the, the trust element and, and the budget element of it as well. So it just seemed to work perfectly. Now, this is a skill, simplifying things, that I've worked really, really hard on in the past 12 months. I've read tons of really crap books on it. I'm reading loads of content on learning design and, and how to teach at the moment to, to kind of separate myself from other trainers and, and content creators. I really want stuff to stick as opposed to you, you just sharing five ways to cold call someone and, and, and crappy content like that. But I've not found a solution for myself, so I'm intrigued to get it for myself. Tom, are there any books, resources? Is it just experience? How do we learn to simplify in business and, and create value propositions where we do a lot of what we're describing here up front so that the buyer can tell us whether we're on the right tracks or not? Yeah, I think there's a couple of um, books that you can use as a uh, reference. First of all, Evolve Selling, which is my book. I will send you a link that I'm happy for you to share with your um, listeners, uh, a free uh, ebook. Uh, copy of it, full book, but uh, just e-access only. And uh, would love for you to share that with folks. And that goes through the way to use neuroscience and Aristotle and storytelling to really connect with buyers on emotion, logic, and trust, what um, Aristotle used to call pathos, logos, and ethos. Goes through some of the Socratic questioning we mentioned. So it's a really good primer to, to kind of go the next step if you like the content we talked about on that. But two other really important books from other authors that I'd like to recommend. One deals completely with trust and the importance with trust nowadays. And a great interview as well, Todd Capone with a book called The Transparency Sale. Absolutely love this book. Took many uh, elements away from it, even though uh, I'm schooled at trust in Aristotle and the neuroscience behind it, he had some really great practical advice and techniques to apply it to negotiating and other elements. Embrace your flossomeness is something that he talks about, and I definitely borrowed it for this. And then another one where I mentioned the research um, is a book that you wouldn't think is that good called Virtual Selling. And why I say you wouldn't think it's good is like, man, it's opportunistic that these guys have a book called Virtual Selling, right? When virtual selling is all we're doing, right? However, the book is fantastic, and it's by the, the Rain Group. Uh, Dave Shaby, uh, a couple of other folks from the Rain Group came together and created the book called Virtual Selling, and it goes well beyond a simple guide of what you would think, but you really have to rethink some of these key uh, capabilities that you've learned to implement, uh, like listening skills. You have to really reimagine them in this world of virtual selling. And they go through the science behind it, as well as so many practical tips that I think would help, whether it be in the value communication piece or the listening piece, discovery, whatever it may be. I think that is another book that I highly recommend, Virtual Selling from Shaby and the rest of the group over at the Rain Group. Awesome stuff. We've had Todd on the show and we've had the Rain Group on the show. So I'll link to those episodes in the show notes of this episode. And I will link to the books in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org as well. With that, Tom, what is, so we're covering a lot of, it's not common, it's common sense, but it's not commonly done, which is an issue, right? Let's flip this on its head slightly. We'll wrap up the show with this, Tom. 
What's the one most counterintuitive thing that salespeople should be doing right now that they're perhaps not doing? Is there anything that, uh, with clearly you're, you're up to date with all the research on this, is there anything that you think, oh, I'd never have thought of that, but in hindsight, it makes total sense that salespeople should be doing that they're perhaps not doing right now? Yeah. Here's the one thing that that I think trip up a lot of folks nowadays. When customers get on these virtual calls, they're wanting to see solutions very quickly because they've done a lot of research on their own. And so they're calling up and they're scheduling demos. They're asking for demos. They don't want long presentations. They don't want a lot of questions. And so I think what's tripping up a lot of salespeople is they hear that and they go into 100% demo mode. Now, if a customer is asking for something, you kind of have to deliver it. But you have to pivot your demos from a big show and tell of everything that you can do. And why does it have to be everything you do? Because you don't know what they want, right? You haven't done a lot of discovery because they're wanting a demo right away and they're not giving you that time. You almost have to change it to be interactive, a very interactive discovery. So you're doing your discovery and you're doing a lot of your challenge analysis and probing and the Socratic questions you need to ask as part of show and tell. So it's a little bit of give and take that you have to do nowadays that I think trip up a lot of sellers. The other thing I find is that buyers are coming in saying, here's the drug that I want you to prescribe to me as if they went to a doctor and said that same thing. And a good doctor will say, okay, I can definitely write that script and you know, here, here's, here's what it does and here's. So if they spend a little bit of time acknowledging that what the buyer said and listening to them, that that's what they want, but then they take a few steps back somewhere in that process and they say, well, I really wanna make sure this is right for you. Can we spend a little bit of time talking about your ailments? Do you, do you think maybe we could run this health check on you? Maybe we can. So. You have to get out of this mode of just delivering exactly what they want to know that there's probably a misdiagnosis, a misframing, a, a better solution that might be in play, and certainly positioning that you need to do to be different other than you know this show up and throw up kind of demo environment that that I see a lot of sellers unfortunately fall into. Yeah, most demos are they, they suck. They're terrible. I'm I'm working with I'm consulting with a, a SaaS organization now. I won't say who they are because they might not like me showing what's going behind the scenes. But the audience will know exactly who it is because it's one of our, our kind of big partners. And one thing that I'm getting a couple of the sales teams to do right now and experiment with is on the Zoom demos. Zoom has a whiteboard built into it. At the beginning of the demo, ask the buyer or the potential customer what they want to what they want to be shown and frame it up as, hey, this is customized for you. I don't want to waste your time. I want to, I want this to be totally seamless. Then writing out on the whiteboard, whether they're using a pen or whether they're just typing it on there, the two or three main things that the buyer wants to see from the demo itself. And then asking why a few times, what's, why is this important to you? What's this going to change? Go for the, you know, the usual sales questions. And then framing it up and doing almost a micro close at that point of, hey, if I could show you these three or four things, do you think this is something that you would like to move forward with? Would it make sense to move forward with this? And the demos went from, I don't have real data on this, so I, I, I don't want to, I, we've got real data. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But the demo, the demo time has shrunk massively from 40 odd minute demos to some just four or five minute demos because buyers want are coming in, as you'd said, the buyers are so much further down the buying cycle. They've done all this research. They've probably watched tons of videos, especially on this product that I'm consulting on now. They've watched loads of YouTube content on it already because they're killing it on YouTube. So they know what they, they know the gist. They've just got a few things. And when you start to then point out those few small things to them and get them to assert themselves, that, hey, if you show me these things, does it make sense to move forward with this? They're having incredible results just on the back of that, just from using, you know, going back. A little bit of structure, yeah. A, a bit of strategy and a, and a whiteboard, which we might have used 30 years ago in the conference room when we walked in and, and did these in person. Yeah, we wouldn't think of not using that whiteboard or using a, you know, some of a, here's what we understand about you kind of agreement. But a lot of times I just see that being thrown away or, or the demos, you do that and it's just almost like perfunctory and you go and still do the same old demos that you do before. Uh, but I found the better alignment you can have to what they're trying to solve and the better kind of diagnostics that you can do while you're doing that, like just don't show them, show them certainly what they want, but then 
make sure you're thinking about you know, companies like you, here's the two other things that they like to see that we've got that you might not have been thinking about. So make sure you're still differentiating yourself with that. Um, I think that's where it really wins because not only are you listening, doing exactly what the buyer wants, but then also adding value to it. And, and then ultimately, how do you tie all of that back to outcomes so you can do the justification? Another really important element, I think, maybe to consider adding to that SaaS customer. For sure. Perfect. Well, with that, Tom, we'll wrap up there, mate. With that, tell us about the book, where we can find it. And I'll link the I'll share the link that you're going to share with us in the show notes. Tell us about the podcast and anything else you want to plug on the show, mate. Yeah, it's real easy. Evolved Selling, as in Darwin, Evolved. Uh, EvolvedSelling.com is where you can find all of the writing and research. Uh, you can find tools, interactive tools, so you can assess where you're at in your journey. Um, you can also listen to the podcast and see some great blog and research articles and get a copy of the book, Evolved Selling, which is also available on Amazon. And I will definitely share that link so that folks can download a free version for themselves. Perfect. I'll I'll just redirect it. We'll do salesman.org forward slash evolve and then that'll go to your link. That'll make it easy for you. You got audience. it. Cool. Right with that with Tom. There. With that, Tom, I want to thank you for your insight today. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's good to have I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll I'll throw this at you because this is important for the audience as well. It's good to have someone on who knows all this numbers, data, is up to date with the research without being prompted by me. It's a real pleasure, mate. So uh, just to kind of give yourself a pat on the back for that, I really do appreciate it. The audience do as well. And with that, Tom, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, Will.